Elon Musk is jumping into every facet of society. Hey, we got Tesla, we've got SpaceX, now you've got X, X, well, that used to be Twitter. You know what I mean. Well, he's getting into politics now, working with Donald Trump. He's getting into Hollywood and entertainment in terms of his commentary out there. He's not letting any of the woke stuff go by. And now Elon Musk looks like he's jumping in both feet into the woke DEI problems of the gaming world, which, as we've talked about many times, is very close to related to the same issues that we have going on in Hollywood. And of all the folks out there that he is using uh, as a sword, he's retweeting our friend Grums out there, who has been doing yeoman's work for a long time now on social media, calling out woke gaming and well grums is here to share a few thoughts on his new friendship with elon musk <laughs> we are entering the golden age of memes <laughs> <laughs> it, it, we we really really are. This is this is kind of the thing that we're talking about here, is that that Elon is he's really touching on various avenues mm -hmm. of of culture. He's not he's not just settling into one thing. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things right here that I want to play because this is where you and Elon have connected. This is this is why he's been sharing you, retweeting you on X. This weekend, it's really annoying when video game gets interrupted by some DEI woke bullshit, and I'm like, Jesus! I just, I was like, I was playing a video game here. Can you just leave the video games alone? It's, it, it, you know, you, you don't want to do things that 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 damage art. Um, so, it breaks you out of the story. Like we've been talking about the last several months, this is kind of the next wave. This is the next frontier of the fight. It's in politics, it's in Hollywood, it's in gaming. It's infected everywhere, and as much as we have seen financial destruction by way of the free market response in, in, in Hollywood, with Disney losing billions of dollars in the last several years on crappy movie and television projects, we're seeing it now in gaming. And, and you have been covering this like few others have. Well, what, what you have to understand uh, about Elon is I, I had, uh, with a friend, I had breakfast several years ago, or well, not several years ago, but right right after Elon made the first offer for Twitter. And he asked me, he's like, well, why is he doing this? And I said, I can tell you, uh, everything he does is for Mars. The man is absolutely serious about going to Mars, and he yeah. recognizes that what's going on in our culture and what's going on with the world and our governments is going to get in the way of getting to Mars. And he, so he's going to use Twitter for a couple of things. And I say he's going to use it for making sure that there is a counterpoint and that he can get his, his policies in place in order to get to Mars. And the other thing is AI. I said he's going to train all of We're all going to be replicants in, in the uh, in, in the X sphere. We're all going to be digitally absorbed by grok and we're going and we're going to have our data harvested and uh and that's exactly what is happening here i mean he has pretty much called out and identified what he calls and i call the woke mind virus what we all call it now i think he coined that term as the major impediment for us being multiplanetary. and so that's where all of this comes from and he recognizes that, you know, what is the phrase? Is it politics is downstream from culture or is it the other way around? Well, uh, you no. know, wait, no, you know, that, look, great point. And this is the tweet. This is one of the tweets, Grums, I've got pulled up on the screen right now, right? This is this was the next this was the second time I think Elon tweeted you out this weekend. And and this is this is going to start a conversation with people out there that, frankly, they're not aware of it. Everybody talks about the culture, the politics. They've not talked about video games, but you're right. The old adage, Grums, is that culture is downstream of politics. I have been personally pushing back on that in 2024. I don't agree with it anymore. I think it was the case for many decades. I think that was absolutely correct for millennia even. But unfortunately, when you have a society that becomes 
run by its government as opposed to government being reflection on society. When, you ha when, you, when you're in a society where government is, is basically controlling the conversation in society, politics is no longer downstream of culture. Culture is now downstream of politics because culture has been stupid enough to hand over the reins of conversation to the government to let them dictate to the culture what they can talk about. We need to put that back in the proper order. Politics does need to get back to being downstream of culture. But right now, for the last several years, especially since 2020, I don't think it has been. But we have to correct it as a culture. We have to correct it in movies. We have to correct it in television. We have to correct it in video games because all these different elements out there, I believe, this is my opinion, this is Renegade Nation opinion, has been too overwhelmingly manipulated. And when you have places like uh, Facebook and Google and former Twitter owner Jack Dorsey going before Congress testifying that, yeah, the government told us, the feds told us what we could say, who we needed to block, the information that we could and could not let out on social media. I'm sorry, uh, politics ain't downstream of culture anymore. It's the other way around. And that is absolutely effing terrifying to me. Well, and we have to fix celebrities that. are so, bought. We saw that in the election. Yeah. Everyone was paid for, and yeah. um, and and it's it, and the the left has long recognized the importance of culture uh, and education in in sort of like you know winning. And uh, this is something that you know I think Elon recognizes immediately, and that is the reason I got into uh, politics on the gaming side in my little corner is because I recognize that this is where I could probably make a difference. And this was important because it affects the world at large. I wasn't into Gamergate 2 just because I, I wanted to see Stellar Blade uncensored. You know, that, was, that, was, that was just part of the censorship regime, the machine that was going on, controlling our culture. And I knew that we had to push back on that. And boy, we pushed back hard this year. We have had so many wins in the gaming culture wars Triple A is collapsing. They don't have any titles this past year that have sold worth a damn. And that's uh, thanks to gamers having better information about what's in these games and not pre-ordering stuff that they don't want to see more of. So I like to think that that's, that's an important avenue. Well, let me ask you this, Grums, because it's easy for people to forget just how different the landscape is now versus in the past. And it's not the very distant past either. I, I just want to ask you because there was a point in time, maybe a year, two years ago, I don't know exactly when you decided to make this strategic move, but of all the developers, in all the studios, in all the gaming companies, you basically stood alone. You basically, in terms of major developers, and maybe you can correct me, maybe there were some other people out there who did this, you essentially took on this dragon by yourself and said, this cannot be part of gaming because it will destroy gaming. Now, uh, post-election, it really looks like that battle is going to be won by people uh, who, who feel the same way you do. So I'm, I'm curious, given how unlikely this scenario seemed uh, in the past, when do you think the battle was actually won? What was the point where you, you began to decide, hey, I think we've got a real shot of winning this thing. I didn't think we had a shot, but I thought it was worth trying. Uh, look, I was around in, in in GG1, and that's when I saw first, that's, that was my first real awakening to the media. And I thought it was restricted to just games media, lying and distorting the truth and promoting a joint narrative that was, I mean, listen, I would have, I would show up at a GG event and I see what would happen. And then the next day I would read some, something completely different in Kotaku about it. That was just a lie, a fabrication. And I was like, I was really naive at the time. I was like, this, this is a misunderstanding, I thought. I thought this was coming from a place of, you know, uh, just, just complete non-connection. And I tried to bridge the gap. That was my first thing, was to try to get journalists and gamers back together. And then I realized over time that it wasn't going to happen. And the funny thing that's happened is we, we actually appealed to the, uh, what is it, the... There was a Society for Ethics in Journalism group. There's a group like this, right? And we said, hey, this is wrong. And there was one guy in there that was like, yeah, I see your point. And, 
He showed us their guidelines and yeah, this is against our, our guidelines and things like that. And so uh, I thought that the mainstream media wasn't infected. But after after 2016, when Trump was first elected, that's when I saw that the same thing that was happening in gaming journalism was widespread throughout legacy media. And I said, oh, we're in trouble. Then everything went dark. Twitter brought the censorship hammer down hard. Uh, I, I tweeted innocuous things for many years. My account was suppressed. I could not grow. Every time I gained subscribers, they would take them away. They would literally just yank them away and trickle them away over the course of five days. And I would talk about this and said, no, it's not happening. There's no suppression or shadow banning. And of course, we, we now know that's all false. And that was actually all happening. So I kept my head low. But then what happened was um, last February, March, when Cabrutus made his list about DEI games, um, I said, and he got slandered for it by Kotaku. And they tried to take away, they tried to ban him and take his games away. I said, OK, this is this is time to speak up again. And now we have X so we could do something about this. And I looked around and all the former GG guys and gals, they had they had moved on. They had gone into politics or, or something else. And I said, oh, man, there's nobody here. And I said, well, well, I could say something. And I said, well, if I open my mouth, I will be attacked like you would not believe. And it was a it was a very ah, momentous decision at that point. And I said, and, and it's, it's really a tweet by Elon that made the difference. He, he's, he said in a tweet uh, that the woke mind virus, that he was in a battle to the death with it because it was a civilization threatening event. Yep. Yeah, I remember and, that. And those words really struck me. And I said, OK, I'll do it. And I started tweeting about Cabrutus and I started tweeting about what was going on. I started pointing out here's uh, the mechanisms by which ESG and DEI made their way into games. And uh, and boy, I, I you know, I, I still take tons of slings and arrows and, and, and tons of lies out there, too, that just get perpetuated. But it's important. It's important because it's more than just games. And this is why we fight. And everybody fights, nobody quits. That's my motto, right? Stolen from Starship Troopers. Yeah, um, yeah. And great line that's, too. That's important. And, and well, look, was, this, this tweet that you made, just real quick. I mean, you said, I, I think so succinctly. I'm drawing a line. I'm rejecting any game that has pronouns in it. And you grammar Nazis know what I mean. Stop being stupid. And you know, when you get a guy like Elon retweeting this. I cannot speak enough as to to how important it is because this is bringing attention. Uh, we can talk about how, look, you and I, Grums and Pro and, and, and you guys, Alan on Film Threat, Tom, you guys on Midnight's Edge, uh, Ron and, and, and Mark uh, have been talking about this as well. Matthew Marsden on his channel, all of our all of our friends and guests out there. We can talk about this all we want. And we've got collectively very good audiences out there. We have some of the best audiences uh, on YouTube. We have some of the best audiences on X. We have some of the best audiences out there, I think, in social media. But we have to realize that we have limitations to what our audiences or our, our, our reach can be. But when somebody like Elon retweets uh, and pushes it out there, it is now going to reach a massive new audience. I mean, at least one, if not two orders of magnitude, maybe three orders of magnitude greater than what we could ever do on our own. The reason that guys like Elon Musk are, are retweeting people in our sphere is because we're making just enough noise to move up the chain, to move up the ladder, to get the attention of the Elon Musks out there was you're causing us to be able to reach even that much more of an audience. This is all dying. This is crap. This is garbage that, 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 is, that is a literal waste of actual shareholder capital. And Grums, I mean, from your side of things, look. They didn't get the memo. About, they didn't know. They didn't get the memo at all. They're, they have to reach a point where they have to decide we have to make money 
Uh, yeah. We can't we, we cannot keep blowing money on woke stuff. If you want to make games like Concord and you want to make projects like the Acolyte, it's all fine and dandy. But you have to understand from a business standpoint that your audience for shows like this are going to be relatively limited. And you've got to you've got to limit yourself to a budget for these type of shows that is commensurate with the audience that is realistically going to show up. So if you want to make a Concord video game or if you want to make Dustborn, then you need to spend an amount of money to make it that is relative to what you can expect as a return on capital. You can't spend $400 million to make Concord and then literally shut it off a week after it opens because it's a disaster because you made a woke piece of garbage. And, and, and you can throw the Acolyte in there and you can throw the Marvels in there. And you can throw the Snow White in there too with the new trailer. So that was the I whole mean, strategy for this year was to 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 have gamers uh, vote with their wallets, identify as non-binary, and not purchase these games because that's the only thing that moves the needle. The, the the needle. And I I knew that we were coming out of the COVID boom and demand for games was slumping and that the budgets were out of control. And this would be the most vulnerable year for AAA, and especially yeah. Ubisoft. And so I identified a couple of titles to really highlight and go after. Uh, you know, Assassin's Creed Shadows was one of them. Star Wars Outlaws was the other. Uh, Concord was a big surprise. I had no idea how big of an investment Sony had sunk into that studio. But I, th I thought that by voting with our wallets and, and playing our back catalog on Steam, that we could apply maximal pressure to these companies and i think that it has had a a pretty profound effect between the economic situation and the pressure that gamers are applying these companies at the very top at least and they're at least their investors are asking the right questions they're asking hard questions about this stuff where it would just fly under the radar before it was just a nice sticker oh we here's our esg report uh look how sustainable we are look how equitable we are and nobody cared but when the rubber hits the road uh you know the investors they control everything. And so if you hit the bottom line, you can affect change. And that's what needed to happen, and that's what has happened. Make sure you're subscribed to Valiant Renegade and join us every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern for the live show.